This tank chat is going to be about this vehicle and the family this vehicle came from, the Italian built Caro Veloci family, uh, which was basically for Italian for light tank that starts in 1929, uh, continues with a series of developments till uh, the early 1940s. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, Italy in the First World War sides with the Allies. It actually originally had a, a, a pact with Germany and Austro-Hungary, but the Allies had persuaded Italy to fight on their side with the promise of lands and new territories. And because of that, Italy was actually supplied with about 100 FT tanks to fight with in World War I. They were interested very early on with the tank and they actually built their own vehicle, something called the Fiat 2000, a big heavy tank. Uh, they only actually make two prototypes of those though. Now they start building their own copy, the Fiat 3000 of the Renault FT tank, but it doesn't get into service till about 1921. So it misses action in the First World War. And it's important, this early development, because it's important to realize the limitations Italy has in building armored vehicles. Now Italy's actually very disappointed after the Versailles Peace Treaty because it doesn't feel, or parts of its society, certainly under Mussolini and the Fascist Party, don't feel they've actually got their just desserts from the Western Allies. And they end up looking for further colonies to continue, they're a late entry into actually the colonialization process that Europe's doing in the 19th century. Uh, they want more colonies and they feel hard done by, which is why they swing to the right uh, and Mussolini gains power. But his actual base for his military forces, and he wants to build up the military forces, not just for propaganda reasons, but again, he wants to actually get further colonies, and that might mean by using his military might to do so, but he's got limited industrial capacity. Now in the First World War that was increased, so companies like Fiat, who had about 4,000 workers in 1914, expand to about 40,000 workers in 1918. But compared to the other Western powers, they are actually still relatively small in terms of their industrial output. So you've only got two fairly major motor manufacturers, Fiat and Ancelado, uh, Milan and uh, Turin in Northern Italy where their industrial base is. So Mussolini has choices to make, you know, what can he do with uh, his limited funding, his limited actual industrial base, and he actually chooses aeronautica, aeroplanes, etc. Again, great for propaganda purposes, and his navy, because again, he wants to concentrate on the navy with the idea that he wants the Mediterranean to be the Italian lake. It's got to be, you know, that they want to dominate in the Mediterranean. And again, as we go back and we've looked with other vehicles, that idea that other countries like uh, Britain is looking at Italy as a greater threat um, until Nazi Germany comes to power in 1933 onwards. Actually, Italy is a bigger threat in the late 20s and early 30s for European stability as they see it at the time. So in 1929, the Italian army, again, the one that's not quite as funded as, uh, or put to the fore as much as the Navy and the Air Force, but the Italian army actually imports from Britain four uh, Mark VI Carden Lloyd carriers. And these are quite rapidly copied and about 21 are built. And this becomes the very first in this family of vehicles. So that becomes CV 29. The idea there, 29, the year it goes into service. Now, they don't last that long in service, or really they're almost like trials vehicles to a certain degree, um, and it's followed quite swiftly in 1933 by a new version of a copy of, again, the Carden Lloyd. This time it's Fiat uh, and Ancelado, they come together, they end up building what will become the, this shaped vehicle. Um, and that goes into service with the Italian military and about 200 of those are built. It's armed with a 6.5 single machine gun at the time. Uh, and again, it, the Italians called it a light tank. Probably most other nations would have called it a tankette. 
And again, as we've looked with the French and the Chenillette and the British with the Cardinal Lloyd, this is a popular way of going at the time because again, with this age of experimentation, the idea of the light tank or tankette, they're cheaper, they're easier to build. You can experiment how you might be using your armoured formations by using these vehicles and not investing a huge amount more time, money and resources in something bigger that you're not too sure you're ready for yet or know how best to design and use. Um, 1935, they improved the model again, so it becomes CV35, and this time round in 1935, instead of riveting the armour plate to a framework inside, it's bolted, and this is actually a CV35 chassis we're looking at here with this vehicle. October of 1935 actually triggers uh, many more of these to be built uh, of this improved mo model because Italy invades from some of its colonies in the Horn of Africa, it invades Ethiopia. And that draws a call for more armoured vehicles to be used by the military. Now there is a final uh, improvement on this CV family of vehicles, the CV38. In 1938, the Italian military, they look at their what's in service, they start a five-year program for upgrading their equipment and they design an improvement that again becomes the CV38. Uh, that's going to have torsion bar suspension, it's going to have a heavier armament on it, other improvements there. But in fact, the company Ancelado doesn't actually get round to building those because there's other priorities for the Italian military uh, until about 1942-43. And very few of those actually go into service, none with the Italian army. Actually, most of those are actually end up being used by um, the German forces that are now occupying Italy. So what do you get with one of these vehicles? Um, for a CV-35, you're looking at a two-man crew uh, in this vehicle. It is a very cramped space that two-man crew are in. Um, they entry from two hatches on the top. There is no escape hatch underneath and that's one of the problems of this vehicle is if you are to turn it, you've got a real problem getting out of it. In the back of the vehicle is the engine that powers this all the way through. So what we're looking at here, um, the engine is a Fiat it's a four-cylinder CV3 engine, it's a petrol-driven engine, and it's actually mounted transversely at the back of the vehicle with a big round fan on the rear wall of the engine compartment. Drive from this engine is taken forward to a gearbox at the front, and the drive sprockets are at the front here. Um, the suspension system is basically, it's a copy of that Vickers Carden Lloyd suspension system um, that you can see, two main suspension units there, and then one actually permanently fixed rear road wheel on the back here. It has got no spring in at all. Um, and the track returns across a piece of acacia wood that's just underneath um, the track there at the top. Um, that, that's taking some of the wear as the track returns back over the top. There isn't actually a return roller in the traditional sense. Um, this vehicle, the engine, can it's got a range of about 141 kilometres. It will get you up to about 27 miles an hour in terms of speed, which is relatively fast for the time. But again, that's going to be dependent on the sort of nature of the terrain that you're going over. Um, but that range is relatively limited. So what they're trying to do all the time is they quite often add jerry cans. You'll see pictures of these with added jerry cans on the front to extend the range of the vehicle because that's quite a limited range you've got there. Um, so on this vehicle overall, um, you're looking at armour plate, the maximum armour plate, 13.5 millimetres on the front, a fair bit of it is about 6 millimetres. Now with a CV35 version, you ended up with two breeder 8 millimetre machine guns in the front mounting there. This of course is a different vehicle, this is actually a flame throwing version. So instead of having the two machine guns, what you've actually got in one of the mountings is a flame gun. And this therefore means it needs to carry fuel. And behind us here, there is the fuel container that would carry about 500 litres of the fuel for the flame gun. That's got eight millimetre armour plate protecting it. There is a connection that actually takes the fuel all the way through. It's not just the tow bar. The fuel goes through that route as well into the vehicle. Um, now that is actually drawn in by a pump that is placed in a circular housing on the back of the engine and that's actually run uh, from the engine uh, when you've engaged it. 
and it circulates the fuel all the way through and it goes on a circular loop so pressure doesn't overbuild in the system. And the idea is the commander of the vehicle, who's also the gunner, when he's ready to fire the flame gun, he can actually, first of all, pull a grip that allows the fuel source to go into the flame gun under pressure, and when he's ready to actually flame, he then presses a nipple on top of that trigger grip, and that ignites three different electrodes on the end, hidden under that flanged armoured housing at the end. There's actually three different electrodes there, which again, they're running off the engine electricity supply when he presses that ignition, and that will get the flame gun working. And they estimate about 40 metres, the sort of range of the flame gun here. If you continue burning, you've got just over two minutes of fuel with you, um, but actually how you'd use this is probably in short bursts of about three to four seconds each. Um, so your fuel should last you a fair bit longer in terms of time. Now, the trailer at the back also has a housing on the rear that also holds a hand pump, and that is actually used for mixing up the fuel. Um, quite often it'll be petrol, but they'll add something to uh, help uh, give a more viscosity to the fuel. It's like a jellier solution that they tend to try and aim for. Um, and that one, again, from the point of view, um, the way this is actually pumped through, what they try to do as well, because again, if you've got 500 litres flopping around there, they've got baffles inside that tank, um, and you use, you tend to use the hand pump any times other than when you're actually in action. Um, so you can actually defuel as well. You don't want to be carrying all that fuel around with you. Um, you can actually take it out again. And there's also a, a, a drain plug underneath um, the actual trailer, so it can drain away. There's other types of trailers as well that are used on the CV33 and CV35 family of vehicles. Um, so when you're seeing one of these driving along with a trailer behind it, um, the armoured trailer is of different shape to the standard trailer that will be being used for carrying extra ammunition, etc. Um, the role of this vehicle, uh, originally, they're looking at using it in this phrase, they call it light tank. It ends up being used across a whole range of different units in the Italian military. Um, they, by the time Italy actually joins the war in uh, June the 10th, 1940, uh, when it joins in the Second World War, it's only got about uh, 200 medium tanks have been built. So they're actually using these in their three armoured divisions that they've got at the time. Um, two battalions of medium tanks uh, are spread around a bit, but really the vast majority of the Italian armour is made up of the CV-33 or CV-35 vehicles. Um, and they're also used in what the Italians called fast divisions. They use them with the cavalry. They also use them in independent tank brigades as well. So you'll see them spread across the Italian military. And in terms of their effectiveness, um, early on, of course, not only are they being photographed and filmed all the time for the propaganda reasons of making Italy look more powerful, but of course, when they're fighting in places like Ethiopia, where the Ethiopian army does not have equivalent armour, of course, they're going to be relatively effective. They then suffer when they're being supplied, and they're actually being used in the Spanish Civil War, they suffer against the Russian-supplied BT tanks, um, so they don't do so well there. Um, and by 1940, when they're being used in the Western Desert, despite the Italians in 1938 coming up with a new doctrine for armour, they're talking about the fast attack, they're looking at what many of us would have called those sort of uh, combined arms blitzkrieg type tactics as early as 1938. They just don't have the equipment to do it. So ironically, their advance from Libya into Egypt when they're facing the British in 19, later 1940 is ridiculously slow and uh, uh, pedestrian. It is not using these vehicles at their 27 miles an hour to actually use them in a sense of manoeuvre and uh, the sort of tactics that actually their doctrine is saying they should be using. And of course, in the Western Desert, they come up against much more powerful pieces of armour, the British Matilda II, later the Grant and the Sherman. Um, so they're relatively swiftly withdrawn from frontline service. But they do see further action. They're used in anti-partisan warfare. They're actually used uh, some on the Eastern Front with Italian forces fighting there. And they do see action around the world because a number of countries buy them. Um, 
They make another version of the flamethrower with just a 60 gallon drum that they actually put above the engine. Um, they're also looking at that vehicle as potentially being air portable. So there's experiments done with some of them underneath a transport plane that, so they could be used with uh, airborne troops in landings. Those vehicles end up again being just being used for anti-partisan activities rather than actually in the role they were intended to. And some of these vehicles actually are put back into service by the Italian military and police after the war. So one or two of them actually see service into the 1950s. But just to give you an idea, they became quite a successful export for Italy as well. 1940, there's about a thousand of these ready to, um, for the Italian military to use. But we estimate around about a thousand end up being sold and exported. And just to give you an idea of some of the countries there who bought it, China, Afghanistan, Austria, Bulgaria, Hungary, Iraq, Spain, Nicaragua, um, and some of those countries then pass them on to another country afterwards as well when they came out of service with their own military. So this is a vehicle that even though relatively speaking it wasn't considered particularly successful, the British analysis and report of this vehicle says about its weak armour, they like the way it drives and steers, they think it's very good, they think it's going to be a problem in the sense it's relatively small, so a hard target to hit, but in essence they're relatively dismissive of it because they see their light anti-tank rifle, the boys can go straight through the armour plate with no problem whatsoever. And again, the Italians are starting to withdraw these quite early in 1941 from frontline service and trying to keep them around the edges, as it were, um, where they're not going to come under threat from anti-tank fire or, in the case of British tanks, two-pounders or later six-pounders and then American 75mm guns. So a vehicle that was brought back to the UK, this particular one, it was analysed, we have the reports on it. Um, they, they thought the flame arrangement was actually quite effective on this. Um, but overall, as I say, they were relatively dismissive of the power of the Caro Veloci. And another one, another point I'd make as well is when you're looking these vehicles up, in 1938, the Italian military renamed all its vehicles. Actually, they then changed the way they're done and do it from the point of it will become an L3 light tank, three tons class, slash the year it goes into service. So it will become L3 slash... 35, 1935 variant, and in this particular case as well, it'll have LF afterwards, which means basically Lancia Flamina, or uh, the flame-throwing type version of the vehicle. Um, so interesting from our point of view, the paint scheme on it, this particular one, it looks very authentic. Actually, it's been repainted over the years, but just looks rather old in this scheme. Um, a lot of, just like the Germans, the Italians had uh, what they would call a Saharan paint schemes and certain uh, uh, adaptions on vehicles that were going out to fight in the conditions of North Africa. But basically, it was a sandy colour that was put on the vehicle.